So I was interested in the fact that literature and the cinema and the theatre told stories about people who hadn't turned up before in stories. And so when I did My Beautiful Laundrette, it was a similar kind of revolution, you might say, that these people hadn't been portrayed before. You'd never seen Asian characters, really, um, on the telly or in literature. And so one of the things that you can do as a writer is bring in new news, you know. Um, these people are here too. This country is changing and, and hello, you know, that's how creativity develops by people uh, opening the door to new voices. And that around that time, there were a lot of teacup empire films like the Raj Quartet or uh, Passage to India that David Lean had made. People uh, under Thatcherism were really fascinated by the master race. You know, there were the whites under colonialism having a really good time and the Indians were rushing around making their tea, you know, and, and making curry for them. But actually, you know, the, the reality was much more like be my beautiful laundrette. And so that's what artists, if you're lucky, you can do that. It's new at the time. Yeah, there was a lot of casual racism that we faced. So the racism of Britain, I mean, Britain's never been a fascist country and has never had a real fascist party, so it's mostly casual people gobbing on you and smacking you about racism and, 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 and the racism, let's say, of exclusion or the racism of superiority that the Brits, certainly after the war, still had those empire attitudes and they thought they were the master race. And they looked down on Indians and thought you were inferior and uneducated and basically born to be their servants. But it's really interesting to be at the, if you can survive it, to be on the receiving end of it, actually. Because it's very shocking to suddenly find yourself the victim of other people's attitudes. Um, and in a sense, that made me want to be a writer, to, as it were, wiggle out of being, in that, being shoved into that hole, into that position, I guess. But at the time, certainly in the suburbs, it was very, very traumatic for me, very, very oppressive. Um, really horrific and I thought the only way out of this is to try and be an artist otherwise I'll just disappear. Well I grew up at a time when, when, when the idea of having a sort of fixed identity was beginning to decline. If you grow up in the 50s and early 60s there was the idea that you know you got married at a relatively young age, you had your kids, you got your house, you did your job, and then you retired. You didn't suddenly become a transvestite halfway through, you know. You, you really were destined to be that person in the civil service, indeed, as my father was. Um, and then in the 60s, of course, with the idea of social mobility, and then the idea of dressing up with more clothes, of being a pop star, of changing your hair, of wearing a different jacket wearing velvet trousers, you, you became, you know, uh, a signifier for other people of difference, as they put it. Um, and obviously Bowie was very important to that, but also pop was very important. I mean, I was fascinated by the performance of pop, acting up, dressing up. Um, and you could see that in the, in, in the Bur of Suburbia. I mean, you can be so oppressed by your identity. So if you are, as it were, a packy for other people, then you are always their victim. You know, you are always, as it were, fixed by their language, by their words. So it's partly to escape other people's idea of who you are, that you might, I don't know, become a hippie, or you might um, decide that, you are a, that your masculinity is of that sort rather than that sort, or you might become gay or whatever. Um, and particularly if you're a victim of other people's words, Well, I wanted to write about the neighbours, the streets, what you wore, the furniture you had. It was really, I grew up at the beginning of consumerism, you know, and you'd spend a lot of time thinking about carpets and everything became sort of disposable and it was really the consumer revolution and you'd buy stuff and chuck it away. So we in the suburbs were the guinea pigs of, of, of consumerism. It's not the dullness of the place, I think, that bothers me, really, is the idea that the expectations of, of those who surrounded us and, you know, um, 
you might say, it was quite difficult to be involved in culture. And that's partly to do with, partly to do with class. I mean, being lower, lower middle class, you might say, everybody around you, the world was much narrower. You couldn't dream very high. You know, if you're lucky, you might move to Beckham, which was considered to be the local apogee of, of, of class. And so I'm quite interested in the limitations and how, if you're lucky, you can overcome them. Those days, you know, people really believed in, 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 in social mobility. So when, when I went to the Royal Court when I was 18, it was amazing to me that to meet people who spent their whole lives working as actors or as writers or as directors or movie directors or whatever, because I'd never met anybody who spent their whole life doing culture. Culture seems so extraordinary and so um, uh, 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 outside of our experience. That the people who did it seemed to me to be like sort of all of them were geniuses. Well, he, he, he's, he's had a big trip, um, Karee. He's come from the suburbs, and at the end, I think he goes to New York with Charlie, and they, get, they start to become quite disillusioned. And really, that's a picture of the 60s as it, as it turned into the 70s, as it turned into punk. It all t turned from, you know, people smoking dope to people taking heroin by the end of the 70s, um, dying in hotel rooms in New York. The idea that you can just have pleasure, pleasure, pleasure. The hedonistic idea of escaping from the sort of Victorianism of, of, of Britain um, at the beginning of the 60s. By the 70s, the hedonism has become rather tiresome. It was a party, but of course parties have to end and, 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 and it becomes decadent and cruel and, and empty. This is really the beginning, by the end of the Buddha, of neoliberalism, of the idea of constant consumption and the sort of Thatcherite Reagan idea that you have to go shopping, of, of compulsive enjoyment, you know. So we, we really move from the period of prohibition you know, you can only have sex if you're married and under certain circumstances and blah, 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 and all of that. By the end, people are exhausted with the horror of having to have a good time all the time. Um, and that was really the story of that period. Jamila's a really interesting figure because, I mean, she's much more serious than him. He's much more like me in some sense, and she also has my seriousness too there. I mean, she's quite serious about her politics, and her father wants her to have an arranged marriage. It's really much, much rougher for her. Um, and she becomes a feminist. But there was something really important about it, that people were really doing serious stuff. They really wanted to find new ways to live. You know, could you live with three people? Um, could you experiment with your sexuality? Could you bring up children in a new way? Um, and certainly the, the feminists, the women, were doing that. So I was thinking about my childhood, about growing up with kids who were, who became skinheads, represented in the film by the working class actor Daniel Day-Lewis. Um, and I'd had an uncle who took taken me around laundrettes because I think he thought the writing business was probably not going to work out. Although I've been working in the theatre for, for quite a long time by then. This is the early 80s. Um, so I had the laundrette stuff. Um, I had some friends who were kind of semi-gangsters, I guess. I had uh, the skinheads. Um, I had... Um, Really, the Thatcherite theme, really, of enterprise, of, of setting up your own businesses. Um, and also, of course, the, 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 the white working class who were sort of represented by the skinhead and his gang, Genghis and Moose and so on, who were sort of excluded, I guess, or beginning to be excluded and would later be represented by people like Nigel Farage because they were really on the margins. Well, I'd been very interested in, as indeed many people have the fatwa against my pal, Salman Rushdie, but so interested in it that I started to research these kids. 
in the 90s who got involved in it and out of my research at the mosque, the college is actually not just down the road from here, not far from here, and then going to the East End and etc, etc, hanging around with those kids. <coughs> I developed the Black Album and later the story of My Son the Fanatic and later of course the movie My Son the Fanatic. That in those days, even after the fatwa, the people were not particularly interested in. Fundamentalism was a thing, they just thought the fatwa was sort of one-off. They didn't realise it was the beginning of a worldwide mo revolutionary movement, you might say, actually. Um, but I just wanted to talk to these kids who were like me and not like me. I mean, they were mixed race kids mostly, um, like me, a Muslim background, who had grown up in the West. And suddenly they were on their knees and they were peddling uh, a version of religion that we had never seen before. And now it turned up in, in, in London and it turned up in the mosques and the colleges. And at the same time, I'd become very interested in ecstasy and dance culture and the, and the new music, because I'd always been interested in music and drugs and, the, and fashion. So they slammed together um, in, the black, in, the, in the Black Album, where I posited a kid, Shahid, I think his name is, um, who was, was interested in both and really likes fundamentalism because it's as it were, comes out of his family. They're Muslim kids like him from a Muslim background and they believe in stuff and they're busy and they have values. And the other stuff seems quite decadent. The West is getting really decadent, mostly fascinated by shopping, by Madonna, by drugs. They're just uh, fascinated by uh, narcotics and, and synthetics and consumerism and plastic rubbish and suddenly he finds an ideology that really stands for something that he thinks is um, important, I guess. That there are real values here, but of course these values are come at a cost, you might say, um, of a certain idea of, of, of women, of what literature should do, of morality and, and, and so on. So he's hypnotized by it and he's torn apart by it. At the end of the book, Shahid, it was quite hard for me to write because you have to find a way through. Um, and he gives up um, his friendships, as you say, he betrays them, which is a really important betrayal. He betrays the ideology for pleasure, um, for love and he sees that these are really important values. But by then, and, and obviously now, it's really hard for the West to justify itself. What are the values that we actually stand for? Is it just shopping and fucking, you know, as Mark Ravenhill put it rather well? You know, what actually are our, our values? You know, do we just want to go shopping? Do we have anything? This democracy, what does it actually mean? This free speech, what does it actually mean? This equality, this feminism, you know, what does it actually mean? What are these values for us? Or are they really just a bit of icing, you know, and the rest is basically just capitalism making money for, for people who, and, and, and creating a super rich elite class that we have now created. It's interesting how we got rid of authority in the 60s and broke it all down. Then it comes back with a swing in the 90s with uh, fundamentalism that really introduces the most virulent uh, form of authority that we've had uh, for a long time, actually. An absolutism that has really been absent uh, from the social realm, you might say. So th uh, that was really interesting to me because in the 60s and 70s we spent, you know, decades smashing everything up, breaking everything down, getting rid of all that obsolete, hopeless authority. Then it swings back in this terrible new form, what Freud calls the return of the repressed, um, with uh, a new form of, you might say, neo-fascistic religion. And it's very shocking because nobody expected that. We thought we'd got, got rid of that form of old-fashioned, paternalistic authority, and it comes back with a, with a, with a bang, as, it, as, as you might say.